chapter 3. This may be a story some of you are familiar with, or maybe not. But nonetheless, it's a good story. It's one of those stories that every time I, I read it or kind of stumble back on it again, it's like, oh, this is good. We need to, we need to talk about this. It's, it's a good story because it's, it's kind of rich in imagery in our, in our imagination as we, as we begin to think about the, what's going on in this story. It's, it's really beautiful, and there's, there's good application for it in our life. It connects with us good. This is, this is one of those stories. There's a handful of those in Scripture that just really seem to connect, and, uh, and this is one of them. Uh, really, there are several of these good stories here at the beginning of the book of Daniel, Daniel 1 through 6. If you're looking for something to read this week, uh, I would encourage you to read those chapters because that whole, whole beginning, the first half of Daniel there, uh, is beautiful, kind of how this unfolds and uh, would make a good movie. Uh, but nonetheless, somebody's probably made a movie out of it. But we'll be in Daniel uh, chapter chapter 3 this morning. We'll pray, then we'll talk a little bit, and then we'll, we'll eventually get to our text, Daniel chapter 3, verse 15. But let's pray. God, we come to you. We thank you for this land that we have to live in, this land of freedom, dear Lord. I thank you that we can come here today and we can read your word and we can sing these songs, dear Lord, without fear. Dear Lord, I pray that we would never take this, this freedom for granted. But dear Lord, I pray that is a nation that you would have mercy on us, that we would be a, a nation that seeks you. And, dear Lord, we hadn't done too good a job of that. God, maybe even amongst Christians, we haven't done too good of a job of standing up for you and living for you. But I pray, God, that you would pour out your spirit on this land, that you'd send revival on this land, dear Lord, that we would be men and women who seek you as individuals and as a nation. I pray, God, that as we look at your word today, that you'd hide me behind the cross, that I would be able to preach and teach in a way that brings glory and honor to you and i pray that you'd free us from our worries and distractions and thoughts of the world but that in these few minutes that we would just hear from you today meet us where we are dear lord we need you and i ask these things in jesus name amen a little bit of a history lesson uh, god's people uh, were living in the land that he had given them but but things were not good for god's people and it was it was because of their disobedience they continually would find themselves into trouble. And eventually, the 12 tribes of Israel would split into, into two separate groups. The northern tribes retained the name of Israel. There were 10 of them. And then the southern tribes, there were two of them, and they uh, were referred to as Judah in the Scripture. Well, God's people were disobedient. And as he had told them earlier in the Scripture, look, if you, if you follow me, I'm going to bless you. But if you're disobedient to me, I'm going to curse you. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, eventually, the Assyrians came in uh, about 722 B.C., and they overtook the ten northern tribes that were referred to as Israel. And, and Judah had a, a couple of good kings, and so they kind of helped get God's people back on track, but, but ultimately the southern two tribes fell too. Judah fell as well. And around 586 B.C., the Babylonians, who were the superpower of the day, came in, and they overtook what was left of God's people. And, and by this point, God's people had been scattered all around into the foreign lands. And we see that in some of the later books in, in the Old Testament. And the Babylonians come in and deported many of these people who were living in the south and, 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 and took them back to Babylon. And, and when they took them back, uh, they didn't really have much of a choice. They were foreigners living in a foreign land and... You can imagine the difficulties there. You can imagine how that must have felt. I mean, I believe that we could probably only imagine if somebody were to come in here today and take you and say, okay, I'm taking you to another place, to a far land that speaks a different language with different customs, and you're gone just like that. And that was, that was what happened to God's people. And this is where we see the book of Daniel taking place. Now, there was a king of Babylon at the time, and his name was Nebuchadnezzar. You'll see a lot about him in the first parts of the book of Daniel. And what the, the officials of Nebuchadnezzar were to do is they were to get some of, the, some of the stronger men. So some of the stronger men that they had captured and deported and, and brought over here, they were to take some of these men, and they were to make sure that they were fit to serve 
on the king's council, in the king's court. They were, they were going to be those who were going to essentially be servants of the king. And so they had a certain diet that they were supposed to eat, and, and they were to make sure that, that they learned the language so that they could speak well. Obviously, they're in a new place, a new language. They had to learn it. And so, so the best of the best were supposed to be picked out, and they were supposed to be ready and prepared to serve in the king's court. And there were four that are mentioned here early on in the book of Daniel. One of them is Daniel. The other one is Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And these four men were chosen. And after they were chosen, it was pretty clear that they were godly men. We see that as we read through the book of Daniel. These were, these were godly men who feared God and who served God and who wanted to remain obedient to God. And so, so these men were, were blessed by God as a result of that. Early on in the book of Daniel, it says that they were ten times wiser than the king's wisest men. And so God had blessed Daniel with the ability to interpret dreams. And the, the, the wisdom of Daniel and, and uh, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah was great. And so these men were certainly uh, prominent in the king's court. Now... Perhaps you're not familiar with those names. You, you may know the other three other than Daniel by the name of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Their names were changed once they were brought into a foreign land, names that would be more fitting for that land. And as we begin to read through this story, we see that Nebuchadnezzar was probably not so unlike the other kings of the day. And, and, and there were certainly many gods that were worshipped in those lands, and God had certainly told his people, thou should have no other gods before me. You worship me, I am God, I am one, I am God alone. You worship me and don't worship any other gods. And Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were godly men. They appeared to be men who feared God and who served God. Well, King Nebuchadnezzar decided to erect this huge statue of gold. So huge, in fact, it was about 90 foot tall and about 9 foot wide. So this was quite the statue that the king had erected. And the king sent out a decree throughout the land. He said, okay, this big statue is here. It is set up. And whenever you hear the music play, he lists a bunch of instruments. Whenever you hear the, the, the instruments play, whenever they begin to make music, Everybody of every tribe and every nation of every language, everybody, it don't matter who you are. It don't matter if you come from the tribe of Judah. It don't matter if you were born and raised in Babylon. Whoever you are, wherever you're from, Nebuchadnezzar is the king. He's made this giant gold statue. And when the music sounds, every one of you better bow down to this statue. Or else, or else, you will be thrown into a fiery furnace. You're going to be burned alive. This is the command of the king. You will worship the statue that I have set up or you will be thrown into the fire. Well, as we see when you read through the book of Daniel, you'll see that Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are not phased by the, by the, the, the possibilities of what may happen to them if they don't do what the king says. Because they are well aware that they serve God. And so they're not so much concerned about King Nebuchadnezzar and his commands, whatever they may be, or whatever consequences they may suffer. Well, there was a group there, Chaldeans, that we see in the Scriptures. And it says that they took this opportunity to bring these charges against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Because guess what they wouldn't do? Well, they wouldn't bow down to the golden statue. Why? They weren't going to worship some statue. They weren't going to worship false gods. They weren't going to worship the gods of that land because they worship Yahweh, the God of Israel. So these Chaldeans went before the king and they said, Look, king, you know, may the king live forever. You're good, king. You're awesome. And what you say is right and everything you say is good. But, but king, we hate to tell you this, but there are some guys here and they... Uh, well, they're not, they're not bowing to this statue that you have set up. They're not doing what you have said. And, well, King, you said that those who won't bow to this statue are going to be thrown into a fiery furnace. Well, 
when King Nebuchadnezzar heard this news, he was, he was furious. He went into a furious rage that here the king, the highest official in the land, that someone would say, we're not going to do what you say to do. So the king calls for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And he gets them in there and he says, look, now here's the deal. Here is this statue. I am the king and I'm telling you what to do. And you're going to do what I tell you to do or I'm going to throw you into the fiery furnace. And in Daniel chapter 3, at the end of verse 14, listen to what the king says. At the end of, excuse me, at the end of verse uh, uh, 15 here. He says at the end of verse 15, And who is the God who can rescue you from my power? So the king's pretty full of himself here. He says, I am the king. I am the one in control. I am the one who has all power. I am the one who has all authority. And you're rejecting me and my power and my authority for your God? You're going to choose your God over me? And what does he say? And who is the God who can rescue you from my power? What Nebuchadnezzar is saying there is I'm more powerful than God. There is nobody who is more powerful than me. I've got the power and authority to kill you, and there is no other God in this world who can do anything to help you. Well, those are pretty strong words. Nebuchadnezzar's treading on thin ice right there. Boy, if I'd have been God, I might would have just struck him down right there, but praise the Lord, God's smarter than me. God says, okay, I'll show this man. He says, who is the God who can rescue you from me? And so God, being brilliant as he is, he answers that question for Nebuchadnezzar. He shows Nebuchadnezzar his power. Let's read verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, Nebuchadnezzar, we don't need to give you an answer to this question. Okay, what's the question? Who is the God who's going to rescue you? That's the question that he asked them. And they said, we don't even need to give you an answer to this question. And why? Here's why. Verse 17. If the God we serve exists, then he can rescue us from the blazing, from the furnace of blazing fire, and he can rescue us from the power of you, the king. Now it says here, if the God we serve exists. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego didn't have any doubts. It's not like they were saying, well, I thank God for real, but I'm not sure if he exists, he can, he can save us. I don't think that's what they're saying there at all. I think they're saying that for the sake of the king, because the king had just said, what God can rescue you? And they're saying, okay, it's our God who can rescue you. And if he exists, he's going to show you. You might not think he exists. You may question whether or not he exists, but I'll tell you this. The God we serve can rescue us from you. King, we're not worried about you. You think you have the power. You think you have the authority. But king, we want to tell you, you are just a man. But we serve God. And the God we serve can rescue us from this fire. What a beautiful, beautiful passage for us to think about today. The God we serve can rescue us from the fires that we are up against. He can do it. Now, there are lots of fires in our life. Now, I hope that none of us are ever thrown into a literal fiery furnace. Maybe that day will come. If it does, we need to remember this story. But nonetheless, there are things that we may call fires in our life, trials in our life, difficulties in our life, things in our life that are really tough, that feel like they are going to overwhelm us and they're going to consume us and they are going to destroy us. But we need to remember that time and time again through the Word of God that we see that God can rescue His people from their fires. He can rescue us from the fires of bad health. He can rescue us from the fires of those who come against us. He can rescue us from the fires of fear. Whatever the fires are that sometimes rage on in our lives, we serve a God who has the power to rescue us. He is greater than all that comes against us. He is greater than anyone who comes against us. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego remind us this morning that we have a God who has the power to save us no matter what we are going through. 
So they said, look, look, king, we don't care what you say. You don't believe our God is real, but we serve a God who can rescue us from you, and we're not worried about your power because he is more powerful than you are. Now listen to this next part here, verse 18. But even if he does not rescue us, we want you as king to know that we will not serve your gods or worship the gold statue you set up. Now this is a good verse for us to remember too. We serve a God who can do whatever he wants. He has the power to work miracles, and sometimes he does. He has the power to deliver his people, and sometimes he does. But sometimes it may not be God's will to work in the way in which we are asking him to work. It's not a, it's not a limit to the power of God. It just is simply that some things are not the will of God. Some things that we desire and that we think and that we want are not the will of God. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were not going to give up on God. They said, we serve a God that we know, that we love, that we trust, and he is all-powerful, and he can do what he wants to do. And if he wants to save us, king, that he will save us. But even if he does not, even if he does not deliver us from this, king, we will never turn from him. That's what they're saying. King, even if God does not save us in the way that we might want to be saved right now, we will not turn on our God. We will not turn to you. We will not turn to false gods. We will not turn to anything else because God is our God and we will stand by him. And what a beautiful word for us to consider today because there are fires in our life and there are difficulties in our life and there are hardships in our life and there are praise, prayers that we pray that sometimes God doesn't answer them in the way that we want and things that linger on and go on for days and weeks and months and years that we wish would end and sometimes we may say why God are you there do you care God but what we need to say God I don't understand why this is going on I don't like this God this is difficult Difficult. I wish you would make it in, but God, I know you are God. And even if you don't answer my prayer the way I want, God, even if you don't save me from this sickness, God, even if you don't get me a better job, God, even if you don't restore my marriage, God, you are good and I will not turn away from you. That's what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said. Their very life was on the line. But these are men who trusted God and loved God. Do we have that type of love and trust for God in our life? Are we willing to be that bold today? Are we willing to recognize who God is and say, this is our God. There is no one else we can turn to. And that's what they told the king. Look, we serve a God who's mighty powerful, way more powerful than you. So we're not worried about you, king. Who knows, our God might just deliver us from this. But even if we don't, even if he doesn't, we still love him. We're still going to praise him. Well, they told the king this. You can imagine how the king took this. How dare they question his authority? How dare they speak back to the king in such a way? So the king is furious at this point. So he gets his strongest soldiers, the scripture says, and they tie him up. Now, you can imagine the strongest, strongest soldiers probably, probably tying them up pretty tight. He gives a command. He says, I want you to heat up that furnace hotter than it's ever been, seven times hotter than normal. I want you to heat this thing up. I want it to be a blazing fire. So they do just what the king offered. They get some of the soldiers. They begin to take Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego up to the door of the furnace. Well, the fire is so hot by this point that the ones that are taking Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego up to the fire burn up. And there Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego go right into the midst of this blazing hot furnace. They're thrown in there, bound, tied up, still wearing the clothes they were wearing. And lo and behold, as King Nebuchadnezzar watches on, he calls out to those with him and he says, How many people do we throw in that fire? Didn't we throw three people into that fire? Then why is it that I see four people in the fire? 
And they're not bound. These men were bound. They were tied up by, our, by my strongest soldiers. But yet, there are three men walking around in the fire. But not only three, there are four. The king says, we threw three men into the fire. But there's four men in the fire. And he says, and one of them looks as though he is the son of God or a son of the gods. That is to say, there's a divine being there in the midst of the fire with them. Now you can imagine that this caught Nebuchadnezzar by surprise. And he calls out to him. He calls out to him here. A couple of verses down. Verse 26. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the door of the furnace of blazing fire and called, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you servants of the Most High God, come out. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire. Now here's a God he wasn't even willing to acknowledge. Here's a God that King Nebuchadnezzar had said that he was better than, that their God couldn't do anything to him. And how does he refer to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? He says, those who are of the most high God come out of the fire. And then he sends a command throughout the whole land. He says, anybody who says an offensive word against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, may their limbs be torn from their body and may their homes be made as a garbage dump because there is no other God like the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. What a powerful story for us to think about today. Because there are fires in our lives and there are difficulties in our lives and there are hard times in our lives and there are times that we are called to stand up for God. These men were willing to stand up for God knowing that they were going to be thrown into a furnace of fire. And too many times we are not willing to stand up for God because we are afraid it might hurt somebody's feelings or it might, it might cause trouble with us and our families or at our jobs and we're just too ashamed to speak up. Yet these men were willing to speak up with their life on the line and this is the example that you and I need to look to. That we need to be men and women who are not ashamed that when the world comes at us telling us what is right and what is wrong, oh, you don't need to listen to the Bible. It's old-fashioned. That's not relevant to us anymore. Here's the new way. Here's what's cool. Here's what's right. Here's what the world said is good. That we have the boldness to say, we're not worshiping that junk. We're not worshiping the gods of this world. We're not worshiping the lies of this world. We are going to stand by the word of God because God's word is right and too many times what the world does is wrong. And We have to be men and women of God that are like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Men and women who say, I am ready to go through the fire for you, Lord. I am ready to stand up for you, God. And here's the most beautiful thing is it's not always easy. I'm going to tell you it's not always going to be easy. Now, God is with us. God gives us the words to say. God gives us the strength. But that doesn't mean that when we stand for God that it's going to be easy. The New Testament is full of people who stand for God, and it's not easy. They're on trial. They're in prison. There are some who uh, lose their very lives for standing up for God. We still see it in our world today. I'll tell you, brothers and sisters in Christ, it's not easy to stand up for God, and it doesn't mean that it's not going to result in a difficult time. Sometimes it does. But here's the beautiful part about this, is that God is with us. Just as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego went through the fire, we go through fires in life. But they weren't alone. There was another in the fire. God was there with them, and whatever form he took, I don't know, but it was God who was there with them in the fire that day. It was God who walked with them. In the most difficult time in their life, it was God who walked with them. And we need to learn that kind of trust. Maybe some of you have discovered that in your life, that there is, there is nothing worse than when we are suffering in this life there is nothing worse than when, when sickness has, 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 has 
is, is just eating up our bodies. There's nothing worse in life than when our families are falling apart, our marriages are falling apart. There's nothing worse in life when there's conflict and when there's hard times. There's, there, those, those things are real and they're serious and they hurt and they're difficult. But there's something beautiful about those times for the brother or sister in Christ. There's something beautiful in those times for the child of God. Because if we really seek God's Word and we really love God, then it's in those times that we begin to pray to God and we begin to call out to Him and we begin to trust Him and depend on Him more than ever. And I suspect for some of you in this room today, you could probably tell me a story about how you were as low as you could possibly be. But you turned to God and you called to Him in the midst of your fire. And there was God. The presence of God. And there's peace and there's joy and there's comfort that comes even in the midst of our fires when we trust God. Now, there's probably some of you in this room today and you're looking for that peace and that comfort and your fire is raging on. I don't know what it is. I don't need to know what it is, but I know that there's some in this room because life is hard for all of us, and there's some fires that are raging on in your life today, and you need some peace, and you need some strength, and I'll tell you, you'll get it from the presence of God. Because just as Nebuchadnezzar said that there is one like the Son of God who is there with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, I'll tell you today that there is the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who is with us today in our fires. That Jesus Christ died on a cross for you and I so that we would not have to walk through our fires alone, but, though, but that so our sins could be forgiven so that He could strengthen us, so that He could restore us, so that we, He could make us better men and women and prepare us for our eternity, so that when we go through the fires, we'll be unaffected because we'll know that God is greater than whatever we are up against. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were thrown into the fire with their clothes on. And yet at the end of the story, it says they came out and they didn't even smell of smoke. Whatever your fire is today that you think you can't go through, by the power of God, He'll be with you. He'll deliver you. Maybe He'll deliver, it, deliver you from it in this life. Maybe sometimes the way God delivers us is by taking us to the life to come. But when we trust in Jesus Christ, the fires that we are up against, they will not consume us. When we give our life to Jesus Christ and trust Him as our Lord and Savior, He delivers us. We're unaffected, just as... Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were unaffected. For all of eternity, we will reign victorious with Jesus Christ. And what a beautiful story this is for us today. What a beautiful example to teach us how to trust in God. And what a beautiful example of how God shows up when we need Him the most. He wants to show up for you today if you'll call out to Him and seek Him. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we come to you. We thank you for these good words. And I pray that you would bless these words, dear Lord. I pray that as we battle against the things of the world, dear Lord, there are always things that are, that, are, that are pushed on your people, dear Lord. Things of the world that we are called to accept and just to, to, to essentially worship, dear Lord, and praise these things. But, dear Lord, we don't want to be those who praise the things of the world. Dear Lord, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did not praise the things of the world. They did not praise the gold statue. They did not praise King Nebuchadnezzar. God, they praised you. So God, let us not celebrate and rejoice sinful things in our world today. God, let us be those who are bold enough to stand up for you. God, I pray that you would help us to trust you like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did. That we would not, we would not doubt you for a second, dear Lord. God, I pray that we come to you with our fears and our, and our troubles and our, and our difficulties, dear Lord. That we pray for your deliverance and for your guidance, God. But even if you don't answer our prayers the way in which we ask, God, even if things don't work out the way we want, God, we will not turn from you. I pray that we would be those today that would not turn from you. God, maybe there are some here today and they've never put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. God, maybe they've been walking through the fires of life and they feel like they're about to burn up, dear Lord. I pray today that they would know 
that Jesus Christ is your son, that he gave his life on the cross, that his blood was shed so that our sins could be forgiven, so that you could give us deliverance and peace in the midst of our fires. So God, I pray that if there are some that do not know Jesus today, that they would repent of their sins, turn from their sinful ways and turn to Jesus. God, maybe there are some in here today and they are yours. But nonetheless, dear Lord, those fires in life, they come. There are seasons, dear Lord, where life is tough. And maybe there are some here today and they're in a tough season. I pray, dear Lord, that they would know that they are not alone as they walk through the fire. That just as you were with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that God, you are with us today that you walk with us. And I pray, God, that if there are some who are struggling, that they would seek you, that they would call out to you, God, that that they would feel your presence today, that they would feel your peace, that they would feel your joy, that you would encourage them. And I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.